Well, good morning, church family. So good to be with you today on what is known as Palm Sunday. And because we are celebrating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem in the week that he would be crucified on Good Friday, and we are a week out from celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, today we're going to be studying Matthew chapter 21, which is the triumphal entry and his account of the triumphal entry. Uh, this is an event we find in all four of the Gospels. So if you could join me in Matthew chapter 21, we're going to be reading verses 1 to 11. Matthew 21, 1 to 11. God's word says, when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately uh, he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Uh, Zechariah, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray as we open God's word this morning. Father, we ask that you would bless the reading and the study of your word, that you would open our eyes and open our minds, that we would understand it correctly and give us the wisdom of the Spirit to apply it rightly to our lives. Lord, I pray that you would use us this morning. I pray that you would uh, let your word accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it, and I pray that you would fill your servant with your spirit. Anoint me with power that I might preach the word as I ought. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This was a scene in the triumphal entry unlike any other scene. Jesus had just healed or raised Lazarus from the dead, and the eyewitnesses were going about spreading the news of this miracle and, and causing basically a great excitement among the people, as you can imagine. At the same time, the uh, pilgrim Jews, they were called Galileans, were uh, coming up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. And when they realized what Jesus had done in this miracle and found Jesus on the way at the foot of the Mount of Olives, they all went up together praising Jesus and this great multitude into Jerusalem. And you can only imagine that there was pandemonium. Some have estimated that there were about two million people in Jerusalem for this celebration. And the reaction of the people uh, was different, as you also might imagine. The Galileans who had come up from uh, Galilee and, and had, had ascended up to Jerusalem basically viewed Jesus as their hero because he was from Galilee. Basically, here we have a miracle worker and we're with him uh, wanting to almost maybe even gain from his fame. Then you have the Jews from Jerusalem who really didn't know Jesus as well as the Galileans and almost saw him uh, as a threat. And so they obviously, seeing the multitudes that were surrounding Jesus, rejected him and eventually would lead to his crucifixion. So you have different groups, different factions, those who saw the miracle of Lazarus, the Galileans who were ascending up to Jerusalem, the Jews who lived in Jerusalem, and yet all were left with one central question. It is actually the question that defines this entire passage. It is the question that defines our entire lives and defines all of human history, and it is the question of verse 10, Matthew 21, 10, where he says, When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? That is the central question of life. Who is Jesus? That's the question that the disciples asked in Matthew chapter 8, in the same book of Matthew, whenever Jesus got up from napping and calmed the storm, and they said, Who is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? That's what the demon said in Mark chapter 1, a, a question that he answered when he said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is the same question that Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 when he said, yeah, well, you've told me what the crowds say, but I want to know, who do you say? That I am. This is the question that defines all of human history, and this is the most important question of our lives. And it's the question that Matthew wants to answer for us in this event. 
His recounting and his account of this event is meant to show us who is this. Well, first, I'd like, to, I'd like for you to see that Jesus Christ, in answer to that question, is the Lord of all creation. Now, I want to tell you something this morning without, equivocate, without equivocation. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all creation. All creation belongs to him. It belongs to him because he is the one who created it. John chapter 1 verse 3 says this, All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He has creation rights over the entire universe because it was made through him. But not only that, he's not just the creator, he is the heir, the legitimate heir of the entire universe. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed, watch this, heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He is the legitimate heir. And that is why John, in John chapter 1, speaking of Jesus' coming, said, he came to his own, meaning his own world, the world he had made, the world that belongs to him. And this is why the great theologian from a century ago, Abraham Kuyper said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. He rules it all. And perhaps you're thinking, but what does it have to do with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem? I wonder if you notice the way that Jesus spoke about creation in this passage. It almost seems to be an emphasis of Matthew. Go back to Matthew chapter 21 and watch what Jesus says as he approaches Jerusalem and tells his disciples to go into the village opposite them, this village that was immediately in front of them, and they would find a donkey tied there in a colt with her, untie them and bring them to me. And watch what he says in verse 3. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now remind yourself here that Jesus, humanly speaking, was not the owner of this donkey or her colt. And yet, as Lord of all creation, everything belongs to Jesus. And when the Lord of all creation has need of something to fulfill his purposes, the creation obeys. It all belongs to him. Remind yourself that what he told his disciples to say, if anyone says anything to you, simply say this, the Lord has need of them. When the Lord needs something from his creation, the creation obeys. Remember what the disciples said, who is this? That even the storm and the wind and the waves obey him. When the Lord of creation shows up, the creation falls into line. It's interesting if you compare this with what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, when he says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him, and watch this, for him, for his glory, for his use, for his purpose. When the Lord of all creation needs part of his creation that he has made, the creation recognizes its maker. And it's interesting if you compare actually the parallel account of this event in Mark chapter 11 when Jesus says this to his disciples. It's an interesting uh, note that Matthew doesn't pick up on. But it says, go into the village opposite you, Mark eleven two, 2, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one yet has ever sat. Now, uh, remind yourself of the importance of that. Think about that as it pertains to getting on a colt that has never been ridden before. What do you think will likely happen? This colt will buck and resist, and yet Jesus brings a colt that has never been ridden and sits on top of it, and the colt does exactly according to the purpose of Jesus. Why? Because the cult, the creation recognizes the Lord of all creation is on my back. Hmm. It's interesting if you compare this also with Psalm chapter 8, in which the psalmist was actually writing about humanity and the, the role that humanity was meant to play as an image bearer and reflecting the image of God and his dominion, and yet Adam fell. And so Jesus fulfills this as the image of God that has come to reflect perfectly the glory and dominion of God over creation. And Psalm 8, 6 to 8 says, 
You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put him, you put all things under his feet. Watch this, all sheep and oxen and also the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. Jesus is the one who came to fulfill the purpose for which God had given. He is the perfect God man who reflects perfectly the dominion of God over creation because he is the God over creation. Interestingly, if you, if you look at Luke's account of the triumphal entry in Luke chapter 19, you end up here with the disciples saying to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your, your disciples. And again, we see Jesus as the Lord of creation. Watch what he says. Jesus answered, verse 40, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When Jesus comes, when the Lord of all creation appears, creation recognizes and creation obeys. The demons obeyed him. The winds obeyed him. The waves obeyed him. The storm obeyed him. The colt obeyed him. The donkey obeyed him. And now he says, if they don't praise me, then the rocks themselves will cry out. Because when the Lord of all creation comes, the creation recognizes. Well, not only that, Matthew doesn't want us to just see Jesus as the Lord of all creation. He wants us to see Jesus as the humble Savior. Is it not interesting, given what we just saw about Jesus as the Lord of all creation, the way that he chose to enter into Jerusalem? Remind yourself that this is the Lord of all creation with purpose and intentionally sending his disciples to get a colt and bring back to him to bring him into Jerusalem. This is not something the disciples did on their own accord. This is something that they did in obedience to Jesus, and this is a colt, not a horse. One commentary said it this way, This was not the normal manner in which kings arrived, for they usually came as conquerors riding on horses. And yet Jesus did this as an intentional sign of humility. When he said, go get a colt, he was doing that as the humble, obedient servant fulfilling the purpose that God had given him in eternity past. Why do I say that? Because look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 4. This is what Matthew says. This is the reason Jesus did this. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. When Jesus took his seat on top of this colt, that was him taking the place that was reserved for him by the Father from eternity past. This was the only throne Jesus had in this world. Uh, remind yourself of what he left. He had been seated on the throne of glory from eternity past, and he left it and came into this world, and the only throne he found was sitting on top of a colt, which represented humility. Why? Because he was becoming humbled even to the point of death. This is what Philippians chapter 2 says to us. Who, when Paul says, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, watch this, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Think about that, the humility of the Lord Jesus it's interesting, if, if you think about Jesus in this humility and taking this spot on top of this animal which represented humility, it's actually interesting to know who put him there. Now, at the end of the day, we, we all know that it was actually according to God's will that Jesus was put there. And yet, when you read the parallel account in, in Luke chapter 19, here's what you find. Luke 19.35, they brought it, meaning the colt, to Jesus. And they, the disciples, threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. Now, read that again very carefully. Who put Jesus onto the colt? Well, of course, we know that he was ultimately there in in fulfilling the prophecy that God had given him, fulfilling the purpose for which he was there. And yet, look at this image. It is the disciples that take Jesus and put him in a place that is a symbol of humility, that is a symbol of him becoming obedient to the point of death. Why? Why? Because who put Jesus in this position? We did. Jesus came to be humbled and obedient to the point of death because of us. Because of our sin, this is a picture of what we put him there. 
It was our sin that held him there. It was obedience to the Father that held him there. And he was there because of our transgressions and our sins, because he was carrying what we had done. And think about him. Think about him as, as, it, as it pertains to this prophecy. It says, he's coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of, watch this word, burden. Watch this. He's on the foal of a beast of burden because he's going to carry our burdens. Isn't it interesting what Jesus himself said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29 to those who are burdened? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Here he is sitting on this beast of burden, which is a symbol of humility, and he is becoming humble to the point of death, taking the place that was reserved for him from eternity past, and he is carrying our burdens. And this is what another commentary said that I really love. A cult was a symbol of peace. He wasn't coming to us like a conquering king this time. He was coming to us as a king who was humble and was wanting to give us peace because at the end of the day, why is it that he was humble to the point of death? It was so that you and I might have peace with God. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is this Jesus? Who is he? He's the Lord of all creation who humbled himself to the point of death to carry our burdens that we might have peace with God. Well, not just that. Not just that. Jesus Christ is our, is, is our priest, our prophet, and our king. He's the Lord of all creation. He's the humble Savior. But he is also our high priest, our prophet, and our king. It's interesting to note that this was the only time in all of Jesus' ministry that he made himself the center of a public demonstration. One commentary said it this way, This was the only time in his ministry that Jesus actually planned and promoted a public demonstration. Up to this time, he had cautioned people not to tell who he was, and he had deliberately avoided public scenes. Actually, if you look at John chapter 6, they wanted to make him king, and he basically fled. In all of his ministry, he had avoided these public demonstrations and even told people not to confess who he was. So why is he doing this now? The reason he's doing it now is because his hour had come. Jesus knew that the Jews, when they saw all the multitudes following him in this big public display, would be motivated to kill him. And that did not catch Jesus by surprise one bit because this was the whole plan. He came to die. And that is precisely what happened if you read John 12, 19. This is the parallel account in John. The Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. And ultimately, that's why they killed him. But this was all according to plan because Jesus came to die. He came to be the sacrifice. He came to be the sacrificial lamb that would take away the sin of the world. According to John the Baptist, remember what he said to his disciples. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And imagine this. Jesus sat down on that colt so that later he could sit down at the right hand of the Father as our high priest, having made purification for sins. That's what Hebrews 1.3 says. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And now ask yourself, why did he sit down as our high priest? Because it had been completed, paid in full, no more debt, price has been paid. There is no more reason for sacrifice. There is no more reason for animal blood because the blood of Christ was spilled and his blood is infinitely precious and sufficient to cover over our sins forever. Our high priest sat down. And what is our high priest doing? To this day, Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Watch this. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. What is he doing for us? He is at the right hand of the Father, seated, pleading the blood over our lives continually. When Satan accuses us, if you have received Christ, listen to this. He got on that colt so that he could be your high priest. And sit down at the right hand of the Father and intercede for you until you are safe at home in glory. That's good news. Well, not just that. He's our prophet. 
Remember now, there's three basic groups that were here in this whole triumphal entry. You have the Jews who had, uh, the crowds that had seen him raise Lazarus and were all excited. And you have the Galileans that are pilgrims coming up. And you have the Jews in Jerusalem that aren't very familiar with Jesus. And that's the reason they say in Matthew 21, 10, who is this? And the Galileans, probably not understanding uh, exactly what they're saying, or at least the depth of what they're saying, they say in response, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the prophet. Now, when they say this is the prophet, what they're referring to is this is the prophet that is the long-awaited prophet who would bring us the word of God that was prophesied all the way back in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses said this before he died. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. The point was, God is going to raise up a leader who is going to give you the word of God like me, but better than me, and you will listen to him. And they waited for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, and Jesus came. And how did he come? It says he was the word of God in flesh. In fact, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, Peter, James, and John, and he was transfigured and took off the veil of his flesh and the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God was shining out. This is what God said from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Watch this. Listen to him. What's that mean? The prophet has come. He is the quintessential revelation of the word of God because he is God incarnate. That's why John 1, when he talks of him, he says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who's from, who's from the bosom of the Father has revealed him. He came to show us God and reveal to us the word of God. And he is the quintessential revelation of the word of God. Why? Because look at what Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 says. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. In these last days he has given us the ultimate revelation because it is God himself in human flesh speaking to us. That is why we do not need another revelation to correct the revelation that we have from Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate, final, best, and quintessential revelation from God. He is the prophet. And that is why it's so tragic to see what he said about the Jews and about many in our day. This is so applicable. John 8, 43, Jesus said to them, being the prophet who has come that they've been waiting for, he said, why don't you understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. They couldn't hear it because they didn't want to hear it. And brothers and sisters and those who are watching this video who do not know Christ, let me say to you this morning, let us not be like that. Let us not be like those who did not want to hear the word. Let us not be like that who would not bow our knee to Jesus. Let us be like Simon Peter in John 6 when he said, where, where are we going to go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. I'm not leaving. You're the prophet that came, and I'm here with you. I'm listening. I'm listening. He's our high priest. He's our prophet. But also, and I think this is the greatest focus of Matthew's passage, he's our king. This is the whole book of Matthew. In, in the entire book, he wants to show us that Jesus is king, not only of Israel, but of the whole universe this is why he starts off speaking of the genealogy of Jesus as the true descendant of David, the greatest king that Israel ever knew. Matthew 1, 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, watch this, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's how he begins his book. He, he ends his book in this way. He concludes his book by giving the great commission that says this, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, watch this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. What's that mean? Go extend my reign, my kingdom to all the nations because I am the king over all the universe with all authority in heaven and on earth. He's the king, and that is the focus of Matthew, and particularly when we see what the people were doing for Jesus. Matthew 21, 8, back in our main text, says, 
Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The reason that they did this is that this was a sign. This is what they did in the Old Testament in the coronation of a king. We see an example of this with Jehu in 2 Kings 9.13. When they proclaimed Jehu is king, they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. When the people placed their coats before Jesus, it is as if to say, the king has come. And look at what they say about him. Matthew 21.9, the crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, citing Psalm 118, an ascension psalm that the pilgrim Jews would sing as they went up to Jerusalem, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means God save us now. What an appropriate response given what Jesus came to do. And yet the Galileans and those who screamed this were probably thinking God has come to save us from the empire of the Romans that has been oppressing us for years. And yet they didn't understand that what they really needed was salvation from their sin. So when Jesus goes to the cross and he dies and he rises from the grave three days later in victory, we know that what he did was he conquered sin and death and the grave and Satan. And that is why as the people of God, we sing 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? And when Jesus completed the work of redemption, this is why Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 9 to 11, for this reason also, him becoming obedient to the point of death, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus Christ sat down at the Father's right hand, he did not sit down just as high priest and just as prophet. He sat down as the crowned king over all of the universe, and one day we will see him, but he will not be riding a colt. He will be riding a horse and coming as a conqueror. Uh, Revelation 19, 11 to 16 says this, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will Will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He came as a humble king the first time to bring peace, but he comes as a conquering king the second time to rescue his church and to judge the enemies of God. And in that day, we will see the end of the prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah says, your king will come humble to you, and yet this same king one day will have a dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And for those of us who are Christ followers, let us proclaim, who is this? Who is this Jesus? He is the Lord of all creation. He is the humble Savior who came to be humble to the point of death and to give us peace with God. And he is our priest and our prophet and our king. And for those who do not know Christ, who are watching this now, let me say to you, you better come to terms with him now and not wait until you see him on a white horse because then it will be too late. Jesus Christ came to save but he's coming again to judge. Who is this? Who is this? That is the most important question of your life. And if this morning you're willing to say, who is this? I trust you. I trust you as the Lord of all creation. I trust you as my humble Savior, placing my faith in you, placing my life in your hands. I trust you as my priest. You made a way. You split the veil. I trust you as my prophet. You're the one that brought the word of God. And I trust you. You are the king of my heart. If you'd say that to Jesus this morning, he is standing with open arms to receive you. Who is this? He's Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. 
Lord, we are grateful for King Jesus. And we exalt you, King Jesus, today. May you be exalted and glorified in the worship of your people. And may your word be used to accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. For Christ's sake.